Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gregory Naj, N-A-G-Y, and I'm director of Harvard's Center for Hellenic Studies here in Washington, DC. My other job is to be a professor at Harvard University's Cambridge campus, where I happen to be um, in charge of a course that is going on right now on ancient Greek hero. And what the students, all 226 of them, are required to do is read all of the Iliad in translation before October the 7th, 7th when they have an exam. And, uh, and to make sure that th they get the full impact of the Iliad, uh, I arranged with the head teaching fellow um, in Cambridge, uh, Keith Stone, um, and with the help of our wonderful team here in Washington, DC, to live stream uh, this beautiful event. Uh, it's very important for me in the few minutes I have in introducing our genial uh, uh, speaker, Gareth Hines, to remember the things that I must say because I will be feeling very guilty if I don't say them. So one of them is to welcome Allison. <laughs> Uh, another one is to thank uh, the two um, people whose brainchild this event was. One of them is Ali Marbury, who is standing over there, who is the programs manager for the Center for Hellenic Studies. And the other is uh, Lana Coley, who is also here, who is, besides being programs manager in her own right, there she is. Uh, is also the director of fellowships, uh, which is a very important aspect of our intellectual life. And speaking of intellectual life, uh, I think the mind always has to be sustained by food and drink. And I must not forget that after this event, we will all adjourn to um, the big building, as I call it, over there. And uh, you must not run away before joining us there. A uh, last, last item of business is that when our speaker finishes um, his formal presentation, there will be a, a time for questions and answers. And um, what I want to make very sure of is that I hand over this microphone to um, my colleague, Ali, who will be making sure that everybody gets to speak in the microphone. And I think we're supposed to do it like this, which is rock star pose. Uh, but uh, um, what, what Gareth, my dear friend, has already promised to do is to repeat the question in case people didn't hear it. So let's see, have I taken care of all the rules of the game? Then, then dear Gareth, my dear friend, do you mind if I say a few things about you? And I have a script here. The only part that I want to make sure I don't forget is uh, th the great work that Gareth has done on other masterpieces of world literature. And um, besides uh, accomplishing this great feat of producing graphic uh, novels, versions of both the Homeric Iliad and the Homeric Odyssey, uh, my colleague and friend Gareth has also uh, made similar um, projects on such classics as the Beowulf, King Lear, The Merchant of Venice, Romeo and Juliet, and Macbeth. How do you like that? <laughs> I just love it too. And uh, because uh, my whole life has been um, all about studying the Iliad and the Odyssey, I'm going to mention uh, two of my favorite um, visualizations by Gareth. And uh, he may mention it in his talk, he may not, but I just have to do it. So in my kit of the, the various beautiful tableau that are on exhibit at the big building at the center, the one that particularly moves me personally is um, number four, Gareth which is Hector and Andromache and Astyanax, the beautiful farewell of a family where um, because the father is leaning over to kiss the son, 
whom he'll see for the last time, uh, the child gets so frightened by the, the horsehair helmet that he starts crying. And at that point, um, the parents uh, and the focus is on Andromache, um, they smile through their tears, which is one of the most beautiful mm -hmm. moments. And I think you mm -hmm. are an amazing visualizer in how you handle it in, in number five. Mm -hmm. and, and then naturally, um, number six, Andromache's grief is again, one of my favorites. I, I really think that in the Iliad, the way um, Andromache, that character, the wife of Hector, the mother of Astyanax is quote unquote, quoted by the poetry, but it's really a morphologically accurate lament. It is something that this man has really managed to capture visually. One last thing, please forgive me for going on and on, but it's a token of my admiration for your work, is there's this beautiful scene in Odyssey 8, where a, um, a singer whose, uh, whose sight is impaired, sight of being able to see things in everyday world is called upon to sing the story of Troy. And what he does is in the original Greek, fine da oidein, fine da oidein, which can't be translated. It means something like put the spotlight on the song, but he makes the song the spotlight. It's a beautiful, way of expressing how verbal art can transform into visual art, which is exactly what my dear friend and colleague Gareth Hines does so masterfully. Please forgive this, uh, this elaborate introduction, but uh, will you please join me in welcoming our guest speaker and artist and genial friend, Gareth Hines. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Nash, for that amazing introduction. Um, it's always so great to hear that my images are connecting. Usually I hear that they're connecting to students, which is great, and that's a big part of why I do this. But it's also amazing to hear that they're connecting to somebody who has studied these epics for so long. Um, and I also want to thank Lana and Ali for all their work uh, putting this together, um, and Zoe, and everybody at the center uh, who, who has had a hand in this uh, and has helped me out. I did some research here. Um, as well over the years. Um, and it's really, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to all of you. I assume that you're all big fans of the classical world. Um, and um, I'm actually going to step back a little bit from, um, from the classics and give you a little background on how I got to be doing this. Uh, so what I like to do is actually to start when I was about four or five years old. <laughs> and this is kind of my first picture book. Uh, this is a sketchbook that my mom put together for me out of scrap paper with wallpaper covers tied together with string. And instead of filling it with a bunch of unrelated sketches, I filled up the entire thing with a single picture story. And I knew from reading picture books growing up uh, that I wanted each page to have an image and some text on it, but I didn't want to take the time to figure out exactly what the words were going to be. And I didn't really know how to spell them. So in my five-year-old phonetic spelling, this says, I do not want to write at all. <laughs> and then the next page, it continues in pictures and it says, I will not write anything. <laughs> and I started signing each page as well. I knew that was something artists did. And it goes on like that for about 25 pages. Every page has, has an elaborate drawing and some variation of, I do not want to write at all. And later on, of course, I figured out that I could, you know, I could write the words later. I could write them ahead of time. I could do wordless comics. I could also use existing words um, and existing stories. And so in middle school, I started to draw actual comics where things would take place in panels. I would come up with a couple of main characters and like a logo, like you might see on the Sunday funnies. And most of these are very short. They're like a half page or a page long. And then I would be jumping onto the next idea. Um, but then gradually they got a little bit longer. And then in high school, I did this strip that ran every week in my school newspaper for two years. So that was kind of my first really long form storytelling. Uh, I was also doing little editorial illustrations and I went off to, to art school and I was doing some editorial and some book covers and all kinds of things, but I kept coming back to comics and this was my senior thesis project. My senior year, I had to pick a project to work on for the whole semester and I decided to adapt a Brothers Grimm fairy tale called Bearskin. 
And I was, you know, at the time I was reading, rereading Brothers Grimm and thinking about all the psychological stuff, Robert Bly and, and all this. Um, and, uh, and I was like, ooh, you know, this would make really good material. Of course, the Grimm stories are only a couple pages long in their original form. Uh, but I told this mainly without words and it ended up being an 80 page graphic novel. So that was my, my first real book. I went out, I self-published that book. I took it to a few publishers, but I didn't get uh, much interest initially. So I self-published it. And then I decided that I would take what I had learned from, from that experience about the publishing industry and do an adaptation of a better known book. And I chose Beowulf because Beowulf is kind of like one of our early superheroes and he goes around fighting monsters. And I thought this would kind of help connect the modern superhero comic with ancient literature. And then much to my surprise, uh, this is a sample from each of the three sections of the story, the three monsters that he fights. Uh, to my surprise, I found that there was this educational market and this educational need uh, for these books and that that was really where my audience was. Uh, so that kind of gave me permission uh, to, to continue working with the classics and I decided if I was going to work with the classics, I should try Shakespeare. And I did, my, for my first outing, I did King Lear, which is one of my favorite of the, the Shakespearean tragedies. I, didn't, I wasn't quite clued in yet that most of my market is like middle school and high school. And this is more like a book you would probably read in college. That's when I read it. Uh, but I did have a lot of fun with this. And I found Shakespeare was really fertile ground because I could, I could really uh, take some liberties with the story, with, not with the story, but with the visuals because of this long tradition of setting Shakespeare in different times and places and cultures. Um, so anyway, so I did, I did King Lear, I did The Merchant of Venice, and each one of these you can see kind of has a different visual approach. Um, then at that point was when I decided I was ready to do the Odyssey. I'd thought about the Odyssey right from the beginning, but I knew it was, it was huge and it was gonna be an enormous project. So this was the point where I decided I was ready to take it on. And of course I was very inspired by all the mythological elements um, and all the monsters uh, and so on. And I'll, I'll talk more about some specifics. Uh, I also did another book about Greek and Roman mythology called Gifts from the Gods, uh, which focuses on stories where the characters' names have, have continued to be used as common English words and phrases like Achilles heel, uh, fate, fury, and so on. Uh, and then I returned to Shakespeare. Uh, I did two more. I did the Romeo and Juliet with a multicultural cast of characters. Uh, and then I did Macbeth. And then after that, uh, my publisher really loved the, uh, the sort of super creepy stuff in Macbeth. Um, and so they, they asked me what else I was gonna do that was creepy. Um, and I said, well, hang on. Cause I have a little, I have another little project I've been meaning to do. I did these illustrations for a nonfiction book called Samurai Rising which is by Lisa Linga Larson. And if any of you are interested in Japanese history, a really fantastic uh, retelling of the, um, uh, the story of Minamoto Yoshitsune. And then I said, okay, here's my answer to what else I can do that's really creepy, uh, was my, my interpretation of Poe. So this book is seven uh, stories and poems uh, by Poe, including The Pit and the Pendulum, The Mask of the Red Death, um, the uh, Telltale Heart, Casco Montiato, et cetera. And of course the Raven. Then I decided I was finally ready to take on <laughs> another big project, but I knew this was gonna be even a way bigger project than the Odyssey. Um, of course the Odyssey is epic, it's enormous. You know, it has this incredible scope, uh, but the story is pretty straightforward and it was relatively easy to condense and it was relatively easy to you know, focus on this one character and his journey. Uh, the Iliad, of course, is this cast of thousands and um, it's filled with these fight scenes and it's hard to keep track of who's who. So I felt like my biggest job and the first thing that I focused on was helping the reader keep straight who all the characters are. So we start off with a cast of characters that shows you all the important uh, Achaeans and Trojans and the gods. The gods are each drawn in a, in a particular color of, of line work in, in both the Odyssey and the Iliad so that you can tell who they are when they are disguised as mortals. I also provide a map in the back that shows you where the, all the, uh, the fleets uh, or all the factions of the Greek fleet uh, came from and, and also all the Trojan allies. Uh, I try to give overviews of the battlefield. Um, this is, you know, kind of a simplified schematic kind of a, of a bird's eye view of 
uh, you know, where these two armies are going to meet with Troy. Um, and then, uh, of course, we get right into the action. There's a lot of, you know, up close personal drama. Um, and of course, the gods are there manipulating everything. This is not, of course, uh, I'm not trying to tell the historical Trojan War. I'm, you know, I'm giving you all the mythology that's in Homer's version. And then actually a lot of my favorite parts are the parts where the mortals and the gods meet. So this is one of my favorite episodes is where Achilles fights with the river Xanthus and it rises up and tries to drown him. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about my process uh, and then I'll talk about sp specifically how it, how, you know, and problems that I encountered with the Iliad and, and how I solve those types of things. But in general, uh, the steps are, you know, I, I work up an outline and a, and a script. Uh, sometimes I can skip the outline because of course I'm working on an existing story, but I usually do it just so I understand the structure. Um, the script is, is just text and then concept art is, is designing all the characters and the settings, figuring out what everything's going to look like. Thumbnails or rough layout or a sketch dummy is when I basically sketch out the whole book in, in a rough form with text and that sort of allows me to work out all the storytelling problems. What are the pictures and how do they relate to the text? How is, how is the page composed? Uh, I'll talk definitely quite a bit more about that. Uh, the finished line art and then the coloring and then things like the, the speech balloons and the sound effects come last. Now, of course, I, I don't read Greek. I did not teach myself Greek in order to do this project. What I did was I worked from a lot of different translations and I would kind of, I would read and compare and then I would um, go back and I would reread a section, put it away and then write it in my own words. Now, the main translations I was working with are, are Fagels, Fitzgerald, and Lattimore, and Ryu. Um, and I particularly like that Lattimore has this really good companion guide um, that had a lot of uh, additional information I found about very valuable. Um, just to give you an idea, my script is almost all dialogue. This entire sample is dialogue except for this where there's brackets that indicates an, you know, an action, a description of the action. But I only do that for really important things. This is a very important moment, Achilles, when he starts to draw his sword because he's so angry at Agamemnon. And that, of course, would have been a, an irreparable rift. Of course, there was an irreparable rift, but it wasn't bloodshed right there because Athena stopped him, right? Athena appears behind him and grasps his hair. It's this wonderful um, visual moment. So I made sure to, you know, to, to note that in my script, but basically this is just all dialogue. And as I read it, I, you know, I, I can remember and I can picture what's going on. So I don't need to write a lot of description. If I was writing a script for somebody else to illustrate, then I would have to do a lot more describing what's in this panel and you know, how is it staged. Uh, and then I design all the characters, which in the case of, of a lot of them is just a matter of brainstorming and imagination. But I also use inspiration from like classical Greek pottery, um, you know, like a vase painting of Athena, uh, I might sort of take inspiration from to do my version. I try to be fairly historically accurate, but not 100%. I'm, I was more interested in being faithful to the literature and to Homer than to um, the, all the archaeological, you know, details that we know. And of course, there's a lot of details we don't know. So I had to make things up anyway. Uh, so I kind of prioritized the, the literature and the mythology over the history, but I still did a lot of research uh, on the period and I did a lot of brainstorming about the mythological elements, such as the monsters in the Odyssey. And, you know, figuring out ways to make the characters distinct from each other, which involved doing lots of different kinds of armor and different helmets, uh, maybe a wider variety than, than you would actually have seen on the battlefield, but also at the same time, trying to kind of, like, kind of color code them and make it so you could tell the two armies apart, which would have probably been really hard in the actual historical version. Um, but I tried to give them kind of distinctive color palettes uh, and distinctive styles of armor. Um, most of the characters are just drawn from imagination, but there were a couple of characters. I used people in the, in the Odyssey, I used real people for some of the characters. And so in the Iliad, uh, those are still based on those people. And the, the main two characters who are like that in the Iliad are Menelaus and Helen. And this is the only time you'll see Helen without her veil because I decided that, um, you know, it's a difficult problem to try to make her look like the most beautiful woman, you know, in the world every single time I draw her. I mean, even to do that once, much less to do it over and over again. 
Uh, <clears throat> and I also, you know, Homer describes her putting on a veil the first time she goes out in the Iliad. And I decided that she probably would wear a veil all the time because she was tired of all these men doing ridiculous things every time she showed her face in public. Um, but this is the, the uh, um, sketch that I, that I based that on before I drew the veil on her. I also looked at, um, in addition to looking at classical vases and, and pieces in museums, I also looked at reenactors. Um, and I, I found lots of people who were, you know, who've made authentic armor or, you know, who go out and play around with spears and swords and things. And I would look at these videos and just, you know, sketch from them to figure out things like hand positions and musculature. Um, and then I even, I got myself a shield and a sword. <laughs> I didn't bring it tonight, but, uh, <laughs> but there's a picture of me with it at another event. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not super authentic and the sword is just plastic, but, uh, but it was useful to be able to do things like try and figure out how they would sling the shield on their back and then bring it back into play, which Homer describes a lot. And, and it's, that's actually kind of a tricky problem visually to, to, to figure out. So that's why I, why I did that. You can sort of see there's a strap there. I got this, you know, I attached a strap to the shield that wasn't on there when I bought it. Uh, that allowed me to to play with you know how they would how they would wear the shield. Uh, so at a certain point, I, I signed a contract with my publisher, and then I need to create a schedule that says you know when can I deliver this book, and and I sort of have to kind of break it out and figure out for every month or every half a month how many pages I'm supposed to have done, which is which is important because at some point I almost always fall behind. And I need to know like how far behind am I? How much trouble am I really in? So you can see, for example, this was part of my schedule for Romeo and Juliet. And I was, I was kind of falling behind a bunch, but I, I was never like super far behind. And at, this, at the point where I started to feel like I was in trouble, three weeks behind, I could sort of make a calculation and figure out I had to do two extra pages a week in order to catch up. Um, and actually the, the schedule for the Iliad is much longer and much messier than this. I actually had to re do the schedule several times because my wife and I actually moved twice in the course of it and all kinds of stuff happened. So um, it was a little, it was a little past due actually, um, but it was worth it. So the next part, this is actually my favorite uh, part to show you is when I do these rough sketches um, or rough layouts, I like to do these digitally. Oh, I have a lot of tab, a lot of windows. Open. There we go. Um, and the program I used to do that is Adobe InDesign. I, start, I started doing this digitally. I used to do it on paper, but uh, I was having to guess at how much room the text would take up and I was having to redraw things a lot. So what I like to do here is I'll just drop some chunks of text into a, into a blank page layout and I'll just start drawing, you know, what I think might go with that piece of text. I am drawing this in real time. And my ability to do that is largely just based on many, many years of drawing. It also helps that like right now, I'm just kind of drawing a generic character. It also helps that this piece of software actually isn't a very good drawing tool. Uh, when I zoom in, you can kind of see that it makes this really weird lumpy line. It feels like this is a plastic pen and I'm drawing on glass and it's, it's very, it's not, it doesn't have a very good tactile feel, um, but it's good enough for these rough sketches. And so it sort of just reminds me to, to, to stay loose because then, you know, after I draw it, if I draw a bad line, I can undo it. And then I can, I can sort of scale things and I can move them around. I could try, I could do a different version if I wanna, sh if I wanna see maybe this guy zoomed out a little bit more because basically the types of decisions I'm making here are about what I wanna show for each moment of the text, you know, what, what kind of a shot, as if I'm like a film director with a camera, you know, what kind of a shot do I want to show? Do I want to focus on the, you know, the relationship between these guys or just on one of them or the body language, or maybe I want to focus on the setting. So it, for example, I might decide to zoom further out than this. This is what we would call like a medium shot or a two shot because you see two people in frame or an over the shoulder shot because you're looking over one character's shoulder. But I might instead want to do an establishing shot at the beginning of a scene where maybe we see like, 
a little windmill. Maybe we see the characters walking up over the hill. So I might want to start off the scene with something like that. And maybe I'll even just drag the, drag the text down and then maybe we'll do something like this. So basically the, the, the actual drawing happens very quickly, but the composing of the page takes a while because I'm playing around with these different ideas about where do I want to, you know, where do I want to put things and um, what is the best image to go with each, each moment uh, or each, each piece of dialogue. Um, I might want to zoom in instead of zooming in like on a character's face, maybe I want to zoom in on like, maybe he's offering the guy something and the other guy's going to take I don't know, some coins or something. This is a kind of a very a generic example. And I'll give you a couple of specific examples of how I solved particular story problems after this. So I might, I might do something like that. I might put in some rough panel borders. And then I would show that to my editor uh, and a couple other early readers and I would get feedback. I would make some changes. Maybe they're confused by something or, you know, they can't, you know, maybe the camera moves too much and they, they get confused about where people are standing, something like that. Uh, or if it's an action scene, they get confused about what's happening. So I'll make changes. I'll end up with something like this. This is a rough uh, layout for spread in the Odyssey where Menelaus is talking with the old man in the sea right after he captures him. And then <clears throat> I like to use traditional materials for the, um, for the finished art. And so what I did in the Odyssey, I printed the rough <clears throat> sketch out very light on watercolor paper, drew over it with a heavier line, painted it with watercolors, scan that painting, bring it back into the computer, drop it back into the page layout. And then on separate layers, I can add my panel borders and my speech balloons. So that those are nice and crisp and clean, but also they can, be, they can be resized if the text changes a little bit or if it gets translated into another language, the foreign publisher can, can change the balloons. And then for the Iliad, I used basically the same process, uh, except I decided to do the drawings digitally because I wanted to be able to work in layers because these, these scenes were so complex. So I actually drew it on the iPad and the piece of software I used, which is called Procreate, uh, it captures a sort of a frame by frame time-lapse animation of every drawing. So that's what you're watching here is this time-lapse uh, of one of these, the drawing, this is Menelaus and Agamemnon standing up on top of the wall, looking out at the Trojan campfires. And you know, Homer, Homer vividly describes how they, you know, Agamemnon throws on this pelt of a lion when he goes out and climbs up on the wall. And, Menelaus is wearing the cult of a leopard. And so then I would take that drawing and I would uh, print it out again on watercolor paper and I would paint it with watercolors. And the other thing that I, had, that I did differently than the Odyssey is in the Odyssey, I found it was a little difficult painting really dark scenes like the nighttime scenes in the Odyssey with watercolor it was a little bit hard to control how light or how dark it got or sometimes it would get a little blotchy. And so for the Iliad, for the nighttime scenes, I would kind of half paint them, scan that in, and then I would add the darker layers digitally so that I could more precisely control how dark and how light things were. And it wouldn't, the watercolor wouldn't get blotchy. Uh, for the daytime scenes, again, here's an example of the, the rough layout and then the drawing and then the painting. And there's no digital involved in, um, in the painting on, on these daytime scenes. The other thing I did do digitally uh, was go back and fix little mistakes. There's so much, this book is a nightmare for continuity. I had to go through and follow each character and make sure that I got their you know, sword strap and their shield strap and their belt and their, everything was right all the way through. So there's a lot of places like this where I would go back in and add a sword belt, color the tassels on, on the sash, you know, add a, there was a lot of sword belts. Uh, sometimes somebody's armor actually changed from one page to another and I would go back and fix that. And then for the cover, I, I, I like to do lots and lots of little rough sketches like this. I always find covers a little challenging because I have to kind of sum up. I've already done thousands of drawings for a book. I have to kind of sum up everything in one drawing. Um, these were kind of like my favorites. I did some very super rough color and showed them to my editor. Um, mocked up a couple different variations based on, on what she liked. Um, 
this this kind of was hanging in there for a while, but we were pretty sure we wanted to do a um, this you know this scene of the Achaean fleet coming in. Um, but I was still playing with some different color schemes. So here's a final drawing, but then I actually painted it three times. Two different sunsets and a, and a daylight one. Uh, but this, this is the one that we all decided we liked the best. Uh, and then I also, um, I have some books for sale tonight, by the way. And I have paperbacks and hardcovers of the Iliad. I only have hardcovers of the Odyssey because the Iliad is, the Odyssey paperback is being reprinted. Um, but the nice thing about the hardcover, uh, in, in addition to its durability, is that it has these end papers, which are not in the paperback. Uh, and in the Odyssey, it's vases that show kind of the rough story of the Odyssey. And in the Iliad, it's these shields that kind of show the story of the lead up to the events of the Iliad. Um, so, you know, we have like the founding of Troy, the um, Peleus and Thetis. Uh, the sort of beauty contest over the apple, um, Paris abducting Helen, and, and so on, um, including some, you know, some nice little episodes like Odysseus and Achilles sort of trying to avoid the war, um, but they, they, they still get sucked in. Um, <clears throat> so let me just talk about a couple of the, what I like to call problem scenes. Um, problem scenes only because they're hard, they're hard to draw. And one of the things that I found is that uh, there are certain things that, that, in the, that the images can do better than the words and other things that the words can do better than the images, right? That's, that's kind of the, always the tension. And so uh, here's an example of something that the image does better than the words, um, I think. So Odysseus is in a magical disguise that Athena has given him. Nobody can see through this disguise, but it still gets penetrated by two characters. One is his old nurse, Eurycleia. She recognizes this scar on his leg. Um, and in the original, we learn like everything about how he got this scar. There's a whole story behind it and it's full of these great vivid details, but it pulls you out of this dramatic moment where he, you know, he's realized that he's about to be discovered and that maybe she's gonna say something and Penelope's gonna hear it. So um, I found that just with a single image, I could kind of create this flashback uh, of this moment when he comes back from the hunt and maybe this is young Eurycleia, uh, you know, seeing him come back with the wounded leg and the boar. And then that keeps us in this very dramatic moment where he claps his hand over her mouth to keep her from speaking. Conversely, sometimes it's all Homer has to tell you is that his dog Argos has been waiting for him all this time and it recognizes his voice and you know, it's, it's like 20 years old, this dog. And um, as soon as they kind of have this moment of happy recognition, it puts out, down its head and dies. And that becomes the most emotional moment in the whole book. But it's easy to say that, but it's actually kind of hard to show it in a way that is subtle and sensitive and clear because the dog was already almost dead at the beginning of the scene. And when he puts down his head here, it's still not clear that he's dead. And so I had to bring in something that's not in the original in order to accomplish the same thing, uh, this is kind of a fancy way of, of showing the dog's spirit leaving its body by having Athena actually come down and lift it out of its body. And I actually sketched this out about 10 different ways. And this was like the only way that made my wife cry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, was the, uh, that was the correct solution. Uh, the other thing that's important is to notice there's a sense of rhythm in comics, and that's one of the things that I'm always trying to, to get right is the rhythm. And this scene on this page has a very regular rhythm that shows you the steps, and then there's a long kind of a rest. And that's important because I had a version that sort of ended with that panel, but then you would turn the page expecting the scene to continue. And so having this kind of empty, long beat to absorb what's happening in the scene and to sort of understand that that's the end of the scene before you turn the page was very important. In the Iliad, there wasn't a scene that gave me that kind of trouble in terms of being able to tell it clearly, but this was the hardest thing to draw, uh, which is the shield of Achilles. And Homer describes the shield at great length. It's like four pages of description of all these different scenes that uh, Hephaestus carves on or emblazons onto the, onto the shield. And I decided that, you know, I actually really was going to have to show this shield and, and all of its detail. Uh, I couldn't really get away from it. 
And so this page took me about as long to draw as like three other, you know, three battle pages um, because of all the detail that's on it. Um, but I do have a video on my YouTube channel where I go in and I zoom into each of these, each of these panels and kind of, you know, track around the shield uh, as I read the, the description from uh, one of the translations. So that was, that was a really, um, that was, a, that was a really challenging scene, but it was also interesting because spending that much time on it. And then like, as I was drawing it, I would listen to it in different translations. And I just, I gained a whole new appreciation for that scene because again, when you read it, it almost pulls you out of the narrative in a way, which is very powerful and very useful because Homer is reminding you all this stuff about what these guys are fighting for and, um, and about sort of Achilles' fate and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you know, the first time, I don't know, the first time I read the Iliad, I was like, why does this go on so long? Um, but you know, it, 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 I gained a new appreciation for how important it is. And yet at the same time, I like that I could present it, you know, in an image that doesn't take you quite as long to read, although you can sit there and pour over it, uh, for, for a long time. Here's a, here's a more close up version. So we have the, the city at peace, the city at war, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, Vineyards, picking from the vineyards, the, the cattle herders, and that, the lions attacking the cattle, uh, the sheep, sheepfold, the dancers, um, the uh, plowing, uh, and the uh, reaping. And the, oh, and of course, the, we start off with all the constellations. <clears throat> and somebody asked me uh, about this, right? This is, I don't know, maybe you probably know more than I do, but as far as I know, we're not sure whether the Achaeans thought that, or whether Homer thought that the world was a sphere or flat or exactly what it was. Um, I chose because I liked the three circles, um, but it is, of course, it is centered on the, on the Mediterranean. Uh, but I don't know, maybe we can talk about that at the reception. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end there, uh, and I'd like I hope you guys have some questions for me. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. We have a we have a microphone. Ellie, and, and while oh good, and, and while we're doing that, I did forget something, which is that the. Another unsung hero is uh, Zoe Lapis. Where is she? And, uh, is she she's, the, she's the third of the amazing organ. There. Now, um, I'm going to sit down. I, I, you, you're, you're, you're very good at, um, at, at running the show. And I, I think if you cut it off mm -hmm. so that before people get too hungry, maybe in 10, yeah. 10 but you'll be the boss. And, when to cut it off, okay? Very good. All right, thank you. Here. Um, so you, you showed us the timeline. Oh. Is it on? Give it late two seconds. Right. It should be on now. Yeah. Yep, there we go. Ah. Is it on? Yes. Uh, um, you showed us the timeline for Romeo and Juliet. And yeah. I was wondering, is the timeline, the two questions. One, it seems to me the Iliad took a lot longer than that. And two, in, in your uh, process diagram, you, you went through the six steps. Do they, do they follow serially one after another or is there some blending and backtracking or? Yeah, so, okay. So um, how, did, how did the schedule for the Iliad compare to other books? It was much longer. Uh, most of my books take about 12 to 14 months. Uh, the Iliad took about two and a half years um, plus a bunch of extra time doing things for the marketing of the book. So I really invested about three years uh, in the book and that was working at a very fast clip uh, as well. Um, and as far as the, the stages and whether they're sort of sequential, they basically are. Um, in theory, I can be, I could be starting to draw as I'm writing the script, except I don't really know yet what I'm doing. So I pretty much go through, I write the whole script, do the whole book in rough sketches, do, draw the whole book and then color the whole book. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah. I like the way you started um, your talk with the whole idea that when you were a child, you 
refused to write words. And then slowly you started adding words to the animations. And yeah. I just wanted to ask you about the relationship between writing and, and the graphic novel and when drawing is not enough, when you need to add the words. Because I notice in some instances there is a lot of um, wording and then suddenly there is silence there. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you how you negotiate that. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. So in that, in that first self-published book that I did as my thesis project, Bearskin, uh, I had tried to use basically as few words as possible. And I really like to work that way. And um, in a funny kind of way, it's almost, the, it feels like the most pure kind of, of comic storytelling to just do it with images. Um, but words can be often clearer uh, when you wanna convey a lot of detail. And, in, so, and so the opposite extreme, I, I found that kind of as I would do these longer and more complex books, I had to use more and more words. And of course, Shakespeare, you know, is like everybody's looking for all the important speeches have to be there. Um, and so, you know, I, I used like if there was a, if there was an important speech in a, in a Shakespeare play, I would I would put it all together. Like I would let you actually listen to that whole speech at once sort of um, in the case of the Iliad, because there's so much going on, because it's so complex. I found that I had to use a lot more narration than I usually do. Normally, I can do most of, most of the work with just dialogue, um, but in the case of the Iliad, I actually had to to narrate because of all these amazing metaphors and all these descriptions of the the emotions of the characters and things that don't all come through in the dialogue. Yeah. Did you also during the time of the classical working on the did you also uh, travel to Greece and Turkey to absorb the light and the horizon, the context of the landscape? So did I, did I go to Greece or, and or Turkey um, as research for this project? So I wish I could say that I went to, I, I have been to Greece. I have not been to Troy. I've actually been to Greece twice. Um, Unfortunately, I went to Greece in between the two books. So it did inform my art in the Iliad, except I hadn't actually been to Troy, but it <laughs> informed my depictions of Greece. Um, the problem that I usually get into is that by the time I have committed to a project, I feel like I don't have time to go anywhere. <laughs> I feel like I'm chained to my drawing board for two years or whatever it is. Um, and you know the, the good news is that these days um, there's very good references, very easy to find video and photos and you know Google Earth and everything. Um, but yeah, it's still ideally I would like to have been there, and ideally I would like to you know be able to stand on you know Mount Ida and look you know around in 360. You know, um, so I had to I had to do what I could to kind of make up for for not having been able to do those things. Um, I'm actually, I'm excited. I'm probably going to be going to Troy next year. And that will, again, be ironic, having already done the Iliad, except that I probably at some point will do the Aeneid and it will inform that. I'm an artist and looking at your drawings, I mean, I, I'm actually amazed at your drawings. I think they're tremendous. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm also interested in your color line. I noticed that in one of the books, you use yellow a lot. Now, why, to me, that's a kind of obsession. Why so much yellow? Not too much red, but a lot of yellow. For the overall palette? Yes. Yeah, so, so talking about that, the kind of the light and the feeling of the Mediterranean, um, the, the palette that I, that I got, and, and that I think is true in, in a number of parts of Greece, the, the, the ground has this kind of very sort of golden color to it. And the, and the sea and the sky are this very, very deep blue. So I was trying to kind of capture that uh, in, in much of the Odyssey and m many of the landscapes in the Odyssey are kind of have that dominant color palette, that sort of blue and gold. Uh, and it's sort of true in the, in the Iliad as well, although there's a, there's a lot of brown going on in the Iliad, right? Everybody's you know, tan and they're wearing bronze and they're fighting in the dirt. Um, so I was having to struggle a little bit to get a full range of color palette out of that setting in that scenario. Um, so that's why you see there's a lot of drawings where the, you know, it's at dawn, it's at sunset, I'm trying to use the light and use all the, the colors of the gods and the colors of the armor to, to make it interesting. I just have another question. If it yeah. wasn't, you could use a computer. 
and your programs, what would happen? If what? If you couldn't use the computer, you're now very involved with the programs and the computer. Because if I could do it free. Yeah, if I couldn't use the computer. Well, the drawing, so like all the drawing in the Odyssey is freehand. Um, and, you know, I still, I still love to, to just draw and paint landscapes uh, in, a, in a very traditional way. It's mostly, the reason the computer becomes necessary for me is mostly in that early stage because I'm working with text and image to be able to move things around, to be able to change the size of the text boxes and see how the text reflows and that kind of thing. That's the most important reason why I use it. And then when I get into just these really complex battle scenes and so on, um, I just found that it was much easier. Like I would be constantly trying to erase if I was drawing it on paper and it's much, much easier to be able to, um, to just cut, put things in different layers and, and you know, erase something that's behind somebody that I draw on top or whatever. Thanks. It's very engaging and I particularly appreciated the last part um, because all the way through I was I was thinking about that passage because it's one of my favorites but also because I was intrigued to see uh, how you handled it um, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about it. I suppose because I see it as that's you know, that's part of the poem where you see Homer as a comic book artist, mm. right? He's kind of arranging the panels on the on the shield and it's a it's a commentary on artistic creation and i mean i just i was kind of interested to hear a bit more about your the choices that you made when you were representing that was it that you felt that you know you didn't want to go into too much detail because you it, it was uh like you know you were uh, you would be identifying too closely with, with Homer or it would be too much like you putting your own process into the, into the book. I just uh, wanted to ask a little more about that. Yeah, so th this idea of the shield as kind of like a comic book um, is, is really interesting to me. I mean, it is, kind of a, it is kind of like an early graphic novel that he's describing to you, which is also an interesting kind of meta art form of like describing a, a comic narrative or a graphic narrative. Um, and the, and of course, one of the things that's a challenge as an artist, when you read that passage, you, he's saying things like, well, and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened within a single panel. Um, and so there's, there are things that on the surface appear to be impossible. And there are some parts of that passage that are impossible to draw, but there's also a lot of things that are, that actually are relatively doable in terms of suggesting the narrative that he's talking about, um, even though it's in static images. But you do wonder, you know, hey, is Hephaestus actually carving moving images on the shield? Because that's kind of almost what he's describing. Um, which seem, you know, <laughs> we, we could believe that of Hephaestus, right? Um, but, but yeah, so, so for me, it was, it was really about capturing enough detail to, to feel like I was doing justice to that description, that everything that, was, that he described, all the major things at least that he described were in there, if you go looking for them, uh, but without um, you know, having to use the magnifying glass to, to, to read it or for me to draw it um, and to just and to keep moving, right? Because I, I got to hit my page goal and I know that that one page is like a whole week. So. <laughs> Um, maybe not a couple of days, um, but yeah. But but like I said, I really enjoyed I enjoyed being forced to spend that much time with that scene. And just as a reflection, I also think like all the the kind of different laments um, that characters make, um, having to just kind of spend time with those and realize that those are kind of the almost the prototypes for the. For the epics themselves and and why we're still reading those is because they were like more like they mourned these characters so eloquently that that sort of became the narrative and expanded the narrative i don't know i'm not i don't think i'm stating that very well but i know like professor naj has said some amazing things along those lines and 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 i've i've had discussions about like that, that, that stuff and and that that kind of reflection of the the narrative that a character tells within the story becoming kind of the becoming the story that you just read. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? It's always interesting to see a, a, a portraiture. Um, what stumps you? Like 
sometimes they say, well, doing uh, uh, characters that are in threes, sometimes you get two characters really good, and then the third one you just don't get. Hmm. And when you're doing a, um, uh, a whole battle scene, is it sometimes difficult to uh, elevate who plays an important part, but somehow dynamic you want. So what, what, what's your, what stumps you? What stumps me? Um, so sometimes it's when there are like, so as you're saying about capturing likenesses, right? That is one of the things that's difficult is to capture characters likeness all the way through. That's true whether you're talking about a big battle scene or you're just talking about two people sitting talking. Um, and I always have a master drawing of that character that I consult every time I draw that character. Or I, or I look back at after I draw them and say, does it still look like the same person? I still get that wrong sometimes. And it's important to me that I have some readers who are very good at identifying whether characters look correct. And my best reader for that is actually my wife. Um, and so she, she will make lots of little notes. And actually I have a couple, of, I have some printouts of, of some of the rough sketches at the table where I'm gonna be selling the books that have some of her notes on them. And you can see like where she's saying like, oh, you know, nose is wrong compared to page 178 or whatever. Um, <laughs> so that kind of thing is super important to, to get that feedback. Um, sometimes I do base them on real people like I did with Helen and Menelaus. Um, but then there's also this question of, you know, how do you put the right emphasis on a moment or on, you know, in a big, in a big battle scene, you know, how do you put the, the correct emphasis on, on a person or, or on the action that's happening. And that's mostly have to do with the composition. Um, and it's usually just a matter of trying a lot of different things until I find the one that works. Uh, and, and usually I can find something that works, although sometimes I would like to spend a lot more time, I would like to spend a lot more panels on something, but I just don't have the panels to spend, so to speak. Um, but, but in theory, you know, I, I could do that if I wanted to spend that many pages. Uh, to show you know to show you the full all the detail of a battle scene that maybe I'm just showing you part of. What was your strategy for dealing with the catalog of ships? What was my strategy for dealing with the catalog of ships? Yes, good question. Uh, actually, my my friend George O'Connor, who did the Olympians graphic novels, each of which is focused on one of the gods, he he said, you know, I don't understand how you're going to do the Iliad. Like you're, the catalog of ships alone is going to kill you, uh, <laughs> and. Um, so the, <clears throat> I just made one spread that shows the fleet encamped and it shows you all the major captains that are gonna come up again and again and again. Um, but I definitely left out a lot of the minor, no, minor nobility, so to speak. Um, I had a version where I had, where I had two spreads and I actually got everything in. But then of course you also have the spread with the Trojans and there's a spread in between that talks about Achilles not, not going into battle. Uh, so my editor thought that was too much. So we, so that's we we pared it down to just the, just the one spread for the Achaeans, one spread for the Trojans. Uh, but it's kind of an overview. So you're just seeing all the ships, and then there are these insets where we see a close up of their of their face um, as the army is sort of pulling out, as the army is mustering and and flowing out from the ships. So that's what I decided to do. There were different versions, but um, but that was uh, that was the solution. I think actually we should probably cut it. So it's seven. We can go for a couple more minutes if you want, but. How about one more? One more question? One more question. And, okay. um, <laughs> and maybe I, you talked a lot about the design and your process, which is very interesting. But one thing I wanted to hear from you is you talked about, of course, you wrote a script, you select the scenes where to look over. So you're the director of this movie, yeah. so to speak. So my question was basically more general. What are you trying to convey to your reader through your own version? Because mm. you're, you're giving us a version of the Iliad. Mm -hmm. Iliad. Yeah. So what is your general vision? What is your reading of the poem that you're trying to bring to the reader through these illustrations? Yeah, uh, well, okay. So what is, my, what is my take on the Iliad? And that's, that's not a simple question, but I'll try to, I'll try to give you a simple answer. Um, so when I, when I read it, when I read it in school and then when I came back and reread it as an adult, you know, I, I had impressions about the story and those impressions I definitely wanted to preserve. I, because if I could sort of sum up my, my general um, artistic 
thing, right? My thing is to try to share what I loved and what I experienced when I read these classics with maybe a reader who would be more reluctant or who would be have a harder time dealing with it in just a straight prose form or, or poetry form. Um, and so, so I want those impressions to come through. But then as I spend more time with the text, I definitely see a lot more things and I start I start, you know, looking at lectures and reading, you know, criticism and, and seeing some things that I didn't appreciate the first time through. So it's a kind of a balance between I want the major notes that are what, what I took away from it when I read it, which, you know, in the case of the Iliad is a lot about how, um, you know, this kind of contrast of heroism versus pettiness, essentially, uh, or, or, you know, um, you know the, the, the kind of the, the spoiled baby Achilles versus the noble Achilles, which are both present. Um, but then also as I get more into it and I, I spend more time with it and I start realizing, oh, there's something deeper here to be said about how people, you know, everybody's like got these entrenched interests where they're sort of trapped into doing what they're doing. And it's almost like there's no other way it could have played out. Um, and so I'm trying to say a little bit about that. And, I'm, and sometimes that stuff just ends up in the author notes because I can't really inject it into the main text. Um, but so there's all those kinds of, of nuances um, come in as I spend more time with it. But that's, I don't know if that quite answers it, but that's the general, that's the general thrust of what I'm doing. Yeah. All right. On thank you guys note, so much. On that note, uh, before, before we thank the speaker, could I just remind all of you that there is a reception um, to honor the speaker and to continue the dialogue in the big house. If you don't know where the big house is, just ask somebody who does and follow them. Okay? <laughs> and with that said, uh, let's adjourn this part of the festivity by thanking our charismatic speaker. Thank you so, so much.